So welcome tonight uh, to this first of a, uh, of a series of talks uh, organized by the Rotman Institute of Philosophy, the Department of Philosophy at Western, <laughs> and by the Public Library. Um, uh, the, topic, the topic for the, this series of talks uh, is uh, belief, uh, evidence and beliefs in the age of mass information. So there's going to be talks, uh, so tonight is the first one, but there are going to be talks every Thursday at this time, this place. So you have your Thursdays occupied now for the rest of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, But uh, we have a great series this year. Uh, so all very good philosophers uh, we're going to talk about different aspects of evidence and beliefs. And uh, so if you want to have more information about the series, you can go on the website of the Rotman Institute of Philosophy. You're going to have uh, all the, the speakers there uh, and explanation of the talks. Uh, but for tonight, uh, we're lucky to have Kaylin O'Connor, uh, who's uh, from the University of uh, California, Irvine. Uh, Kaylin works in philosophy of biology, philosophy of science, uh, game theory. Uh, she mixes all that in a wonderful way. Um, so uh, if you didn't have a chance to read a little bit of her work, I strongly encourage you to do so. After tonight, I'm sure you're going to will. <laughs> you're going to want to read. It's, it's, uh, it's clear. It's engaging. It's, uh, it's something that philosophers should like, aspire to. But, uh, <laughs> Mm. When, when it comes the time to really engaging the public, she really does that well, I find. Uh, she's author of uh, three books uh, already, uh, all kind of coming at once. This year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm. So uh, one book that is uh, about to come, I don't think it's been published yet, but maybe you can correct me here. Uh, so it's Games in the Philosophy of Biology. Uh, and it's one that came recently in July last summer, The Urgence of Unfairness. Uh, it's about crucial categories and cultural evolution. And a uh, third book that came earlier this year, so and which we're going to hear about tonight, The, Mis the Misinformation Age, uh, which she co-published with uh, James Witherall. So with no further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Kevin O'Connor. <laughs> Hi, um, well, oh no. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight and thank you so much to the Rotman Institute for inviting me out to speak and Eric for your kind introduction. Uh, yeah, so as Eric mentioned, this talk is drawing most of its material from this book, The Misinformation Age, which I wrote with James Owen Weatherall. So he is my colleague at UC Irvine. He's a philosopher of physics. He's also my husband, <laughs> which I recognize is a little bit weird. I, people keep saying things to me like, I can't even make a sandwich with my husband. <laughs> this is actually an, a, pretty, a decently fun process writing together. Um, okay, so let me start this talk with a little story. In the 14th century, this travel memoir started circulating Europe. It was purportedly written by a knight named Sir John Mandeville. In the memoir, Sir John claimed that he had traveled to India, and he said that while he was there, he had encountered this plant. The plant had little pods on it, and inside these pods, he said, were tiny live lambs. He claimed that he had actually eaten the flesh of these lambs and said that it was, quote, wonderful. So these lamb plants came to be known as the vegetable lamb of Tartary. And for the next 400 years, European scholars believed that this was a real creature. So you can find pictures of the vegetable lamb in medieval naturalist textbooks right alongside giraffes and elephants the other animals that people in Europe had never seen but had heard existed. So, of course, there is no such plant, and there never was, but this story raises a really interesting question, which is how could the best minds of Europe believe for literally centuries that lambs could grow on trees, despite the fact that all available evidence concerning plants and animals makes such a belief sound perfectly absurd? 
You might argue that right now we're in the middle of a crisis of false belief and misinformation. And a lot of the work addressing this crisis has attempted to explain these false beliefs by appealing to individual cognitive biases and blind spots. So things like human beings aren't very good at reasoning probabilistically. We have these kind of biases at reasoning that make us bad at understanding or dealing with evidence. And this is important stuff to understand, but it's only part of the story. And it's arguably not even the most important part of the story. And the reason I say that is that humans are deeply social learners. Most of our beliefs tend to come from other people. So for example, if you think about your scientific beliefs, probably 99% of them you learn from a peer or teacher. So if I were to ask you, why do you believe that the earth goes around the sun instead of the opposite? If you're in this room, I'm assuming you're on team, you know, heliocentrism. So. <laughs> If I asked you that, I'm guessing your answer isn't going to be that I did a lot of very complicated astronomical observations and calculations and figured it out. The answer is going to be someone told me, my teacher told me, my parent told me, and I trusted them. So this ability to share knowledge, experiences, and evidence is a tremendously powerful resource. Without it, we couldn't have human culture. We couldn't have technology. We wouldn't have sent people to the moon. We wouldn't have modern medicine. It does a lot for us, but it also allows vegetable <laughs> plants to thrive. So if not for the social spread of knowledge, we never would have seen a patently absurd belief like the vegetable lamb surviving for hundreds of years pass from person to person to person. So when we open this door to the social spread of beliefs, we open the door to good beliefs, we also open the door to the spread of bad beliefs. And for this reason, we think that ultimately to understand how false beliefs persist and spread, we need to be thinking of belief as a social phenomenon. So when we do that, this means that there are going to be a set of factors that we want to understand in thinking about false belief. And these are questions that go beyond the ways in which we as individuals are bad reasoners. So questions like, who do we trust and why do we trust them? What sorts of social pressures are we all under when we're learning things? Who in our social networks is actively trying to mislead us and why? How can such propagandists take advantage of our social natures? And how does learning work on social media? So in the book, these are the types of big questions that we explore. And in doing that, we use a particular strategy. So we make use of historical cases, and we also make use of mathematical models to try to better understand these factors in the social spread of belief. So what I mean by a mathematical model is that we create computer simulations, which are representations of real groups of human learners, or representations of real social networks, and then we study these representations to try to understand how beliefs can spread and propagate in the real world. So, Today, in this talk, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about how those models work. I'll more stick to discussing results. If people are interested, I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A. Or you can go read our book and <laughs> hear all about it if you just really are interested in mathematical modeling. OK. So here is an outline for the rest of the talk. What I'm going to do is pull out three topics that we discuss in the book that I think are particularly interesting. So the first is going to regard conformity and polarization. I know you can't read that, but eventually it'll zoom in. Conformity and polarization. Next, I'll talk about um, industrial intervention in scientific belief. And then last, I'm going to talk about journalism and the role of journalists in scientific beliefs. So let's start with conformity and polarization. And it's time for another historical story. So this one is about a woman named Lady Mary Wortley Montague. She's pictured here. She was a British aristocrat, and in the early 1700s, she traveled to Turkey with her husband, who was the Turkish ambassador at the time. Now, Lady Montague had survived smallpox, and she had had a brother who died of the disease when he was very young. <coughs> While she was in Turkey, she encountered a practice called variolation. So variolation is similar to modern day vaccination, 
It involves scratching the arm of a patient and introducing some liquid from a smallpox pustule into that scratch. And what typically happens if the patient gets a mild form of smallpox and is thereafter immune. Now, variolation is not as safe as vaccination. Some small percent of patients would die from it, but given the very high death rate from smallpox, which was something like 50%, it was a practice that saved a lot of lives in Turkey. So Lady Montague was very impressed. She was traveling with a personal physician named Charles Maitland, and together with a Turkish nurse, they variolated her young son while in Turkey. After returning to England, Lady Mary Wortley Montague decided she was gonna to try to spread this beneficial practice of variolation, but she found that she met a lot of resistance when doing this. So English physicians were skeptical. They wouldn't agree to variolate patients. Even Maitland, who had performed a variolation in Turkey and knew it was safe, didn't want to variolate patients when he was back in England under the eye of other English physicians. So here we have this case where we have this beneficial practice, variolation, it can save a lot of people's lives. We have people who know that this practice works, they know that it's good, but this good belief is failing to take hold. So what's going on in a case like this? In the early 1950s, the famous ASH experiments showed that humans have a strong bias towards conformity. We do not like to stick out from a crowd. It is socially uncomfortable to do so, and it's also uncomfortable to do things that others disapprove of or disagree with. So the way the experiment worked was this. Subjects would see these lines, and they would be asked to say which line on the right matches the one on the left. So I want you to think about which one you think it is, and we're gonna take a little vote here. So decide. <laughs> line one, who thinks it matches line one? Line two? Line three? All right. Uh, We're all wrong. The, <laughs> way to stick out, philosophers. <laughs> uh, okay, you were right. There's no trick here. It's line three. But to those of you who raised your hands for line three, I want you to imagine if the entire room had all raised their hand for line one, would you have felt comfortable at that point then afterwards saying, uh, no, I'm line three over here. So that's how the experiment worked. There would be seven confederates of the experimenter who would all say, I think it's line one, I think it's line one, I think it's line one. And then the subject would be given a choice. They have to either say what they think it really is, line three, or they have to pick the thing that everyone else picked. And about a third of them would choose the thing that they knew was false, but that allowed them to conform with the other people in the experiment. So in the variolation case, it seems likely that a tendency like this was at play. Physicians, just like everyone else, like to conform. They feel uncomfortable sticking out from a pack. Even Maitland, remember, who knew variolation was safe, didn't want to do it when the other English physicians knew he was doing it. So something we ask in the book is, how can something like conformist bias influence the flow of information or of scientific beliefs? How did this impact the spread of knowledge? So we built models of this kind of bias, and what we found is that conformity bias tend to make the beliefs, tends to make the beliefs of a community dependably worse for three reasons. So the first reason is that individuals who conform don't pass accurate evidence or information to those in their social network. So Maitland had information about the workings of variolation, but he didn't share it with other English physicians because he was conforming. I actually, just the other day, had an incident where I did the same thing. So I was talking to a fellow dance mom at my kid's dance class, and she had just told me that the inside of human skulls are apparently very rough. I don't actually know if that's true, but you know, social spread of belief, I was like, yes, rough skulls. Uh, <laughs> and I said something like, isn't that weird? Why would, and I was about to say, why would we ever evolve that way? And she said, why would Jesus make us that way? And I said, right. 
<laughs> so, I mean, whatever your religious beliefs, evolutionary theory is largely correct. And as someone who does a lot of evolutionary theorizing, I had a lot of evidence to that point that I could have shared with her, but I did not share it with her because that would have been socially uncomfortable. And I was worried I'd risk our relationship if I disagreed with what she said. So there's that issue. A second issue is that individuals who conform often end up taking actions that don't reflect accurate underlying beliefs. So Charles Maitland had accurate beliefs about fair relation, but he didn't act in accordance with them because he was trying to conform. And a third issue is that conformity can cause stable polarization. So this is probably a buzzword you've heard. People talk a lot about polarization. It happens when you have a community of people with different beliefs and their beliefs remain opposed to each other despite discussion or interaction over those beliefs. So let me give a little demonstration of how conformist bias can lead to polarization. Uh, so this is a little illustration that I made. Made the graphic myself if you couldn't you know, tell. <laughs> <laughs> So suppose we have a network of individuals who are generally trying to figure out how the world works. So that's why I made them little scientists. They're trying to figure out what's true of the world. And let's suppose that they start off with false beliefs. That's what the purple circles represent. So they don't know that variolation works. And furthermore, suppose that like real humans, they can have cliques or clusters in their social network. So English physicians might be tightly connected to each other, but not very socially connected to Turkish nurses. So say that someone develops a good belief or learns a good belief for some reason. They figure out, oh, this practice of variolation works. Because of their social connections, they can spread this belief to others in their network. But someone like this individual, who is tightly networked with another group that doesn't share this belief, might not ever spread it further because of conformist biases. So you now end up with a network where you have two different beliefs. One is better than the other, but the good one isn't spreading because a particular clique is conforming with each other. Now we think this case of what we might call the first anti-vaxxers might actually tell us something about modern anti-vaxxers. Because one thing we know is that anti-vaxxers do tend to cluster in tight-knit communities. So to give a few examples, there are many New Age Californian communities where people have very low vaccination rates. Orthodox Jewish communities in Brooklyn recently have had very low vaccination rates. Somali American communities in Minneapolis, likewise. So they tend to cluster in cliques in the social network. And we think that conformity may help explain why more information does not necessarily help rehabilitate belief in these groups. So people know that it doesn't work to just give more information about how safe vaccines are. That doesn't change people's mind about vaccinating particularly well. We think there are actually a couple different factors at play here, but one is probably conformity. Because when you're in a tight-knit group and nobody else is vaccinating, to go against that is to repudiate other people. It's rude, it's uncomfortable, it breaks the conformity. We also think that anti-vaccine advocates have taken advantage of this kind of social structure. So for example, the Somali American community in Minneapolis has been targeted by anti-vaccine advocates who know this is a tight-knit community that's relatively less connected to the wider community. Andrew Wakefield, the person who did the first fraudulent study on the link between vaccines and autism, has traveled there many times to try to talk to community leaders and convince that group not to vaccinate. By the way, Lady Mary Montague did end up spreading variolation in England. And the way she did it, ironically, was by taking advantage of conformist tendencies. So she ended up convincing Princess Carolyn of Ansbach who was married to the king at the time, to publicly variolate their own two small daughters. And after that, a bunch of people started variolating, and something was going on there along the lines of, okay, people now see that the most powerful, important woman in the entire land is engaging in this practice, and they do the same. So, so much for conformity and polarization. Let's move on to the next topic, industrial influence on science. And we'll start with another story. In the 1950s, Consumer Digest was the magazine with the largest readership in the world. And they published an article titled, Cancer by the Curtain, which 
brought to bear all the evidence showing that cigarette smoking was dangerous. In the following quarters, sales for cigarettes dropped for the first time in decades. The heads of major tobacco companies panicked. Six of them got together and decided to hire one public relations firm out of New York City to try to manage this problem. Now what that firm did is proposed that they do something that had not been done before, which was to fight science with science. In their book, Merchants of Doubt, the historians of science, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, outline this history. And as they show, often the exact same group of men use the same strategies to influence public belief and policy on nuclear war and strategic defense, on secondhand smoking, on CFCs and ozone depletion, on acid rain, and most recently on global climate change. So the tobacco strategy is a strategy that's been enormously successful and that has had very, very serious public health consequences. Part of the reason we wanted to talk about this strategy in the book and in talks like this one is that this strategy and similar methods are striking because often they do not involve fraud. In many cases, industrial and political groups don't need to buy or bias individual scientists. Instead, they bias the body of evidence available to the public about some issue. And their efforts to do this can be subtle, they can be difficult to identify, and they can be very effective, as I'm gonna argue, sometimes more effective than outright fraud would have been. So we think there's a very important misconception about how industry influence on science works. People have this idea that you know, some person in a suit dumps a briefcase of money on a scientist's lap and says, okay, get me a study showing that cigarette smokings are safe. And then the scientist somehow does that. But that's really not how it works. And it's good to try to understand how it actually does work. So there are a bunch of things that the tobacco strategy involved. Today, I'm gonna pull out two particular parts of the strategy, which we call selective sharing and industrial selection and I'll talk about each one of them in turn. Okay, so selective sharing. What is this? So this strategy involves taking real scientific findings that happen to spuriously support industry views and then sharing them widely. So for example, when these big tobacco companies got together, they formed this group called the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. And they said, okay, well, this is a group that's gonna see whether cigarettes are dangerous. We wanna know if our product causes cancer. Um, now, it wasn't a real research committee. It was a propaganda body. But one thing that this group did was create pamphlets, which they sent to doctors, to policymakers, to journalists, that said things like, nine studies find no link between tobacco and cancer. What the pamphlet didn't say was that 50 other studies had found such a link. So they were sharing real data produced by independent scientists who had not committed fraud. They were just sharing it selectively. So part of what, oh yeah. <laughs> Here's what I wanted to pull out for you. Part of what they're doing there is taking advantage of the kind of inherent randomness in scientific data. So not everyone who smokes gets cancer, right? Not everyone who gets cancer smokes. What this means is that when people study this link, some studies are gonna legitimately not find a link between tobacco and cancer. And then industry can share just those studies that by random chance didn't find this link. So we built models to try to better understand the strategy. Here's another quality graphic for you folks, uh, <laughs> showing a bit what these models look like. So we assume we have some scientists who are trying to find something out about the world. Say, is there a connection between cigarette smoking and cancer? Then there are some public policymakers, members of the public, who are developing beliefs about this issue but don't actually test the world themselves. And then there's one last actor in the model who we'll call the propagandist. And what this person does is takes every study from the scientific community that happens to spuriously support the false thing and just shares that to members of the public. So they just share this real data that pushes in their direction. And in doing that, they bias the set of data that the public sees. It no longer reflects the percentages of what's actually happening in the scientific community. Now it has a bias to the wrong belief. 
And what we find is that if we don't have a propagandist in this model, the observers eventually come to believe what the scientists believe. They come to believe something that's generally accurate. And this is because the real unbiased evidence tends to point you in the right direction, tends to show that cigarette smoking is dangerous. When we add a propagandist, this process always slows down. And we find in many cases it reverses. So in other words, this selective sharing of real, independently produced data can sometimes completely mislead the public. Now, in particular, we find that this is harder to do when scientists run studies with large sample sizes or that are of high quality. Um, because in these cases, there are fewer findings for a propagandist to weaponize. So when you're in this kind of regime where selective sharing is happening, every study that happens to show the wrong thing becomes enormously powerful. It becomes a weapon for propaganda, something they can use to convince people of whatever they're trying to convince them of. So it's important in those cases that scientists only produce really high quality studies and evidence. So here's an odd takeaway from this bit of the talk. Just because a scientific finding is real, by which I mean gathered by real scientists using ideal methods who are not influenced by industry, does not mean it isn't misinformation. It depends how it's shared, in what way. All right, so the second strategy I'm gonna talk about today is industrial selection. So this was first named and analyzed by two philosophers of science, Bennett Holman and Justin Bruner. And here's how this works. So industrial selection involves funding scientists who are already using methods favorable to industry finding. So in this way, a body of evidence being produced can be biased without corrupting individual scientists. So if you look at scientific communities, there tends to actually be quite a lot of variation in the methods scientists are using, the background beliefs they hold, the theories they espouse. So what a member of industry can do is look at that variation, pick out the scientists who are most likely to generate findings that are favorable to industry and give money to them so that they have bigger labs, more grad students, they can publish more stuff. And when those papers come out, those papers tend to support the things that industry prefers without ever biasing scientists themselves. One thing to note about this is that there's something extra powerful about it, which is that later if those scientists are accused of industry influence on their research, they can say very vehemently, no, I was never influenced by industry. I kept doing exactly what I was doing. I just used their money to do it. And that's very convincing because it's true. They did keep doing what they were doing. And when they tell that to other scientists, their peers are gonna to tend to trust them as well. All right, so Holman and Bruner identify a really good example of industrial selection, which happened in the 1970s. So researchers had noticed that heart arrhythmias tend to precede heart attacks, which raised a question, if we stop heart arrhythmias, would that stop heart attacks? But people didn't research this question in the same way. So some people were doing studies of antiarrhythmic drugs asking, do these drugs prevent arrhythmia? Other people were asking, do they prevent death? And pharmaceutical industries funded just the former people who were testing whether the drugs stop arrhythmia. And in fact, they do stop arrhythmia. On the basis of this research, pharmaceuticals were able to manufacture and sell antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, but, and you may be anticipating the punchline here, the drugs caused heart attack deaths. It took almost 10 years to identify this, at which point it's been estimated upwards of 100,000 people were killed by antiarrhythmic drugs. So what was going on in that case is industrial selection, industry chose who they were gonna fund, the researchers did their research as normal, but this had very serious consequences for the state of the science. So a big takeaway here, industry influence can be tricky and subtle. It's not always so obvious. It often takes advantage of the norms and social structures of scientific communities, which is smart and effective because scientists are under social pressure not to commit fraud. They're more convincing when they don't commit fraud. And so if there's a way to shape public belief without causing scientific fraud, it's better to use that method than one that's more obviously bad. 
Furthermore, the kind of subtlety of these strategies can lead us to misdiagnose the presence and strength of industry influence on our scientific beliefs. So if we're suspecting the man with the briefcase of money, we may not see industrial selection happening. And I actually have an example of this. So Jim and I had a little email spat mm -hmm. recently with the authors of this article, the made up story about how big sugar shifted the blame to fat. So <laughs> in the 1960s, sugar funded research into the connection between fat intake and heart disease. Uh, what they argue in this article is that, well, the researchers involved were already studying whether fat caused heart disease and they already thought that it did. So big sugar could not have influenced their research, so these guys argue. But what's happening is exactly industrial selection. Sugar picked out which researchers they thought were most likely to generate results favorable to them and just gave them money so they could do more research. So we published this little article in response. And then what's happening is because these authors are somewhat naive to how industry influence works, they're defending industry in this case and claiming there wasn't an effect on the science. So they're misdiagnosing what's happening as a result. So with that, let's move on to the last thing that I want to discuss in this talk, which is journalism. So the tobacco strategy, as we've seen, involves biasing this body of evidence seen by the public, either by selectively sharing things or by, in different ways, shaping what is produced by a community. Given the effectiveness of the tobacco strategy, we think we should be thoughtful about institutions that curate science for the public, that somehow shape and select what types of scientific information the public sees. Consider journalists. One of the job of journalists, especially science journalists, is to communicate facts and scientific results to the public, and in doing so, they have to pick which facts and scientific results they're going to communicate. So journalists adhere to many norms and rules. One has to do with fairness. Uh, so from, the some, from sorry, 1949 until 1987 in the US, the FCC required broadcast license holders to present controversial issues in a fair manner. And what this meant in practice was that all sides of an issue were essentially given equal airtime. And this happened even in cases such as over the health risks of tobacco, where one side had overwhelming evidence compared to the other side. Today, this rule is gone explicitly, but the kind of both sides ethos still remains in journalism. It's often considered a tenet of responsible journalism to show different sides of an issue. Witness climate change, so it's been widely lamented that in the case of climate change, you often see one expert on both sides in some piece of media, despite the fact that essentially all the actual experts are on one side of this issue, that climate change is rigged. So there's, we all know. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we looked at a model. Um, where again, we assume there's some group of unbiased researchers trying to find out about the world, maybe trying to you know, see if there's a real link between carbon emissions and climate change or between tobacco and cancer or whatever. Um, there are again, members of the public or policymakers who would like to know what is real. But now in this model, we add a new actor, a journalist who is curating this data, choosing what the public is going to see. We suppose that this journalist doesn't have some goal, they're not trying to convince people of something, but we give them two different strategies they can use. So one strategy involves essentially passing on all the information from the scientific community. The other strategy involves picking two items, one that is in favor of a belief and one that opposes it, and sharing just those two items each time they share information with the public. So a kind of attempt at modeling fairness. And what we find is, perhaps paradoxically, that fair reporting in scientific cases leads to dependably worse results. In these situations, journalists are overweighting evidence for worse beliefs because generally evidence tends to support better beliefs. So there tends to be more evidence out there in favor of the better belief because science in general is at least somewhat truth tracking, right? So when they present equal amounts of evidence, they're always giving too much weight to the thing that is wrong. 
And what we argue is that a better strategy would involve surveying and reporting on the entire body of evidence in a literature. So looking over an entire body of evidence and then trying to make claims that are weighted by how much evidence there are for different sides of an issue. So a takeaway here is that unbiased journalists who are adopting what are considered industry best practices can unwittingly promote false beliefs or worse beliefs. And fairness is one way this can happen. Now, fairness is not the only mechanism by which this can happen. So I want to briefly discuss three others. So the first is novelty bias. There tends to be enormous pressure on journalists to create fascinating pieces that are going to drive readership. And in the case of science, what people really love are new and really surprising findings. So these are the things that tend to get a lot of clicks, likes, attention. Um, but the issue is that new and surprising findings are often wrong. There's, there's often a reason they seem surprising, which is that they, they weren't true in the first place. So when you see this kind of bias towards novelty, you tend to be seeing a bias towards promoting just those scientific studies that aren't telling us something real about the world. <laughs> Another issue involves reporting on the existence of a false claim or finding. So in many cases, what you see is that journalists are sort of accidentally spreading vegetable lands by reporting that some people have a false belief. So you might see a heading that says something like, Donald Trump says climate change is not real. And if you look carefully at that article, you'll see the point of the article is that he's wrong, but some people will just see that title and see climate change isn't real. And so you can accidentally promote false beliefs in trying to promote true beliefs. And there are a number of variations on ways that just reporting on misinformation can inadvertently spread it. So I'll mention one last thing that I think is kind of important to understand, which is single study reporting. So when you see articles reporting on the results of a single scientific study. Now, I've discussed the variability of scientific findings a little bit already. So in the case of tobacco, we saw that sometimes there are studies that do not find a link between tobacco and cancer, despite the fact that that link exists because <laughs> evidence is probabilistic, it's tricky. So in the context of scientific variability, single study reporting doesn't make any sense because any one study can be wrong. What you wanna be forming your beliefs on is a body of literature that has been developed, debated, tested over time, replicated, not one study which might spuriously show the wrong thing. So I wanna give some examples of this because there are a couple that really cracked me up. <laughs> Science says <laughs> a glass of red wine can replace one hour of exercising. Uh, yeah, good news, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I might be vegetable lambing you right now. Everyone's going to go home like, what did I learn in that talk? I was thinking about red wine. Uh, so you probably can't read the text in the back, so I'll just read this. Are you a red wine drinker? What if I tell you that sipping in a glass of wine can equate to an hour of exercise? Yup, it's tried and tested. A new scientific study has just confirmed this wonderful news. Uh, <laughs> so the kind of naive view of how science works is that you have a hypothesis, you test it, and then you have an answer, right? So if you have that view, you're gonna think this study has told you something real about the world. Now, I talked to another set of people who had sort of similarly had one study show this kind of positive outcome from alcohol. And they want you to know that exercise is not better for you than red wine. In fact, they think that all of the evidence that red wine is beneficial to your health is correlational. That people who are happy, who have friends, tend to be more social, tend to drink more, and it's actually the friendship connections and the happiness that promote longevity. And here's one more example. Forgive me, I could not resist. So this is from the New York Times. Magnets lessen foot pain of diabetics, a study finds. Uh, I'm just going to pull out a few quotes from this. So Dr. Weintraub emphasized that his study was small, involving only 24 patients. So it's a study of just 24 people. Um, you probably can't read this, but it says this study, da da da, runs counter to many previous studies that have failed to show any beneficial effects from treatment with magnets. 
So if you were overviewing a body of literature, you would come away thinking magnets have not been shown to help with foot pain. If you look at just the one study, you might think they have. Weintraub says, we have no idea how or why the magnets work. <laughs> and then 13 years later, again in the New York Times, science and health, for foot pain, forget magnets, it seems. Uh, I'm shocked, shocked that the magnets didn't work out. Um, so these are some of the dangers of single study reporting. I mean, I, if you read further in this article, I think it says Americans spend something like $500 million on magnets every year for health. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up. But I wanna point out one last thing, which is that in this talk, I haven't focused much on the special features of current internet misinformation and disinformation, which we do more in the book. Um, but there are some connections between what I've said and the situation with online misinformation, and I wanna draw out a few of those connections now. First, social media gives new opportunities for conformist bias to influence us, especially when we are selecting and curating our networks, and propagandists know how to take advantage of this. So to give a little example, um, before the 2016 US elections, Russian agents targeted supporters, of, targeted supporters of Bernie Sanders by trying to convince them that their peers were not going to vote. So they were attempting to use conformity to create voter suppression. The people like you are not going to vote, therefore there's some implication, maybe you don't want to vote either. Second, social media gives propagandists new direct connections with the public. So because of social media, reaching you is now very easy for industry, for political groups, for foreign agents. And furthermore, it's very easy for these groups to pose as someone who they're not and potentially someone who you would trust, someone who looks like you or like someone who you would want to take information from. Because a lot of the entities we interact with online, we don't actually know whether they are who they say they are. So to give another example of this, I talked to a woman who before the last women's march in January of this year, got a message that looked like it was from the organizers of the women's march saying it was canceled. So she didn't go. Now this message was not from the organizers of the women's march, it was presumably from some shady industry group who could reach her directly, posing as a trusted person and convince her to do something that she otherwise wouldn't have done. Third, Journalists face new, sometimes counterproductive, incentives online. So in an age where we're not sitting down to the news or reading an entire paper, where uh, readership is driven by likes and click-throughs and kind of attraction, journalists are under even more pressure to be catchy, novel, emotional, attention-grabbing. And these pressures are not necessarily going to create a good informational environment. Furthermore, on social media, because of the way sharing works, more of the content we see tends to be this catchy, attention-grabbing, emotional content, because that is, in fact, what people tend to share more. So it's weirdly an environment that's almost selecting for false things over true things. And then last, I want to say one more thing, which is that none of us should assume that we know what misinformation or disinformation looks like online. So remember how subtle and tricky industry influence could be and how much it doesn't match a kind of naive view of industry influence. The same thing is happening with other kinds of influencers. They have subtle and tricky ways to influence us. And another thing is that as we as a public become aware of how misinformation is working, those attempting to misinform us adapt. So if you'll remember back in 2016, fake news was a huge thing. There were all these sites that kind of looked like news sites, articles that looked like news articles, but weren't. That phenomenon is basically over because people kind of figured fake news out and learned how to resist it. But now there are new things. There are deep fakes, there are catchy memes. People have moved on to the kind of next thing that might manage to trick you. So what this means is that you unfortunately can't just rest easy when it comes to misinformation. It's something that we're gonna to have to keep investigating, keep learning about, and keep fighting if we wanna protect public belief and if we wanna protect our democracies. With that, I will finish. Thank you very much. So now we do a- uh... Yeah.
have yeah, Q and A. Questions I'm gonna let you take any yeah, questions. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be happy to. <clears throat> yes. Um, for things to get changed, or want to things to be applied in vain of thinking about, some of it depends on the personality or the strength of the person with the new idea, like for Darwin and Einstein, were they strong personalities? So yes, these kinds of individual personality differences, they do, they matter to the way that ideas spread and they matter to how convincing people can be to each other. So we don't talk about this a lot in the book, but social trust is something incredibly important when it comes to belief. So we're hearing all these things from people and often we're deciding what to believe, what to take up on the basis of who we trust. Is this person seem like a good source? And a lot of things go into that judgment. So judgments about how similar are they to me go into that. It's not a particularly good way to ground trust, but people do. Judgments about their expertise go into that, but also things that are less tangible, like what's their character like? Are they charming? Are they popular? Do I like them? Do they seem like the kind of person I wanna be like? All of that matters. And so some scientists have been very convincing and that sometimes helped them spread their beliefs. Um, ditto with some people who are just trying to sell, you know, a cult or some other random belief. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the polarization earlier. Yeah. Um, if an average person were to try to be on the level with somebody they know is, has very different beliefs and they kind of set themselves on their hill and they were put on their, on their hill, how would you, how would you level with somebody for who you do? Instead of having them reinforce their beliefs by like calling mm. them whatever, uh, how would you persuade them? Yeah, so this is a really tricky question that a lot of people are trying to deal with. Once we end up polarized, which by the way, it seems that one main goal of you know, the Russian state is to create more polarization in the Western world. Once you're in that position, it seems to be quite hard to change people's minds. More information does not change people's mind. Yelling at someone does not change their mind, being outraged. Um, what we argue, and this is you know, backed up by psychological evidence, is that the best you can do is try to build a bridge with someone by sharing something with them. You know, you and I are both mothers, or we are both Orthodox Jews, whatever it is. Can we build some connection based on shared properties, shared background, shared whatever, that helps us trust each other, and then use that to try to move to a healthier middle ground? Of course, that's not always easy. Um, it doesn't always work, right? Uh, but it does tell us something about when we're thinking about, say, new age communities in California, trying to shape their anti-vaccine practices, the people we might need to do that might be, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow, right? Some, someone who's going to be attractive that, to that community or to fit with them, if that makes sense. Just some doctor is not necessarily going to do it. Yes. Have you had a chance to study how the complexity of an issue perhaps influences false information spreading? If it's a fairly straightforward scientific issue, you know, the neutrino has mass or it doesn't have mass, something like that, it's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But when you get to something like climate change or the anti-vax things, you know, there's layers and layers of complexity. Does that cause a problem? Yeah, that matters. So one thing we point out in the book, and we <coughs> use models in part to do this, is that um, in some cases, there's a lot of evidence that one thing is true and another thing is false, like in the tr neutrino case. Or, you know, if we were doing a randomized control trial where it wasn't that you were smoking cigarettes, one group is smoking cigarettes and one group wasn't, it was that one group was drinking cyanide and the other group wasn't, the results would be so obvious that nobody can kind of deny what's going on in that case. In these cases where you have really good evidence, the social effects matter less, we find. So, the more equivocal the evidence, the harder to parse, the more probabilistic, the more room there is for things like conformity to matter or trust issues to matter. Yeah, um, so uh, here and then we'll yeah do the circle. Yes. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like, uh, based on what you said, it's like journalists have a pretty big role to play in the spread of information or sometimes misinformation. And I'm just wondering what you think the solution is to that. I mean, maybe it makes sense to require any journalist who talks about science to have a PhD in the subject that they're talking about. But even in those cases, if they're you know kind of one of these dodgy scientists you talked about, 
maybe in those cases the misinformation can be spread or bias is already used. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you think it makes sense to have like a, like an authoritative person, like the head of NIH, speak on these issues? Or do you think it makes sense to have both sides of the issue presented by two scientists who see it slightly differently? Or? Yeah, this is a really good question because journalists are often in a situation where they aren't experts in a science. And it can be very difficult to figure out what's going on within a science if you're not an expert in it, right? And so if experts are disagreeing, they might be in quite a difficult position. Now, I think there are some things that we can and should encourage as journalistic norms. So no more single study reporting, instead reporting over a body of evidence. Um, no more fair reporting, <laughs> no more fairness. <laughs> Get fairness out of here. Uh, but that, that shouldn't be a standard anymore. Um, hesitance when you're thinking of reporting on the existence of false beliefs. So all of those things I think should happen. As far as how do journalists go about figuring out what scientists really believe, I mean, a lot of the things journalists are doing now are actually pretty effective. So very responsible journalists will often interview, you know, 10, 20 people within a community to try to get a really good sense of what the issues are, what the experts are saying, why they're saying those things. And hopefully responsible journalism can reflect <coughs> something more like that practice. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering about the role that um, I think uh, I want to call it like different interests might play that populations or, or individuals may have, not in uh, what is true, but in terms of what is um, what they consider valuable in the sort of scope of the question or the, or the belief. The only example that I can think of immediately is um, the way people sort of uh, weigh risks of certain activities. Mm. And so we know that you know airline flying is the safest thing in the world. It's far more mm. car accidents, far more people die in car accidents. But when people think of plane crashes, you only think of people dying. Mm. There's not really you know we don't really think of that as a survivable it, risk it's thing. Scary. And so fun. and so people tend to to way those, those uh, outcomes sort of radically opposite of what the data can say. Good. So what you're getting at is this really important connection between belief and action. So we talk a lot in this book about false beliefs and how we get them. Um, we also talk about why we might want more accurate beliefs. And the general reason is to guide successful action in the world. You know, if if we have accurate beliefs about how a medicine works, then we can use it to heal ourselves. But if we don't, then we can't. Um, we need accurate beliefs to make risk calculations. But there are different things that go into decisions beside belief. And the other, as you're pointing out, is something like values. What do we actually want to happen? Uh, what things do we want for our society and our world? And those kinds of decisions, I mean, should be made on the grounds of what people do in fact want, you know, what, what does a population actually want? What interests do they need represented? So you need to combine both accurate beliefs with some understanding of what people's values are in making successful, if you want to make successful policy decisions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, when I was growing up as a child, a teenager, a young adult, I did everything I was told. I followed all the rules. Uh, and, and when I was 20, almost 21, my life collapsed, I had a breakdown, I was put in a psych ward for three weeks, and I did what my church told me to do and what my teachers told me to do and society told me to do, but none of them came to me and said, sorry, you did what we told you to do and it led to an abyss, we're sorry. They all ran away. I, no, nobody from the church took any responsibility or any other of the institutions, and that really profoundly affected me. What I realized was I wanted, I, I, I obeyed the rules. There's a social contract in place that we don't realize. It's not spoken, it's not written, but if the authorities tell you to do something and you do it, the authorities take response. This is what's supposed to happen. The authorities are going to take responsibility if you do what they, you tell them to do. If you don't do what you tell Where's them to do. Where's the question in this? I'm sorry? Where's the question in this? Yeah, no. I hear a speech. I don't hear a question. Okay, I, I'm trying to share something of my experience that I think is valuable for everybody. Okay. I, there may not be a question, but if you want me to stop talking right now, I can do that. Well, what if we what if we talk afterwards and yeah, to... I'm not complaining. I maybe your response was that I, 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 okay. What I want to say is this: I discovered I didn't care whether something was true or not. 
Really, ultimately, I just wanted somebody else to take responsibility for me and my actions. And after that, I said, okay, well, obviously they're not going to. That taught me to take responsibility for my own actions and start figuring out whether things are true or not. But if that had not happened, I would have gone through the rest of my life just believing what authorities told me. Regardless yeah, of yeah. Whether it was true or not. Well, I mean, there's something there's something interesting in this in this issue that we often do, in fact, have to trust other people to ground our beliefs. So, if you think about the planet thing, I, you're not going to figure out by yourself how the solar system works. You're not going to figure out how medicine works or technology. We do have to trust some people. However, that doesn't mean we should be trusting everyone because there are a lot of people who want to tell us things that aren't true or that aren't helpful, right? That have some reason for us to believe things. And one of the most sort of fundamentally difficult things as humans, figuring out what to believe, is figuring out what sources of information are in fact the ones that are useful to us, that are helpful to us, that are gonna guide us in good beliefs and good actions. And I wasn't critically thinking. Yeah, until, critical thinking until is Until this important. experience happened. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so I know you gave some real good historical examples. How much do you think, you know, this fast information world mm -hmm. um, is affecting this information where mm -hmm. everything has to be a tiny sound bite? You only have two seconds, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about the sound bites and the quick messages. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's affecting the transfer of the misinformation as well? Well, in general, social media, it's clear, has really changed the way information is flowing from people to people. And it's changed the way misinformation flows and works, right? And there seems to be a huge irony here, because I think with the advent of the internet, probably a lot of people thought, great, no one will ever believe anything false again. <laughs> you know, We've got all the true information right here at our fingertips. This is going to be magical. And then instead, what happens is in some ways, this very serious exacerbation of some of the same social effects that have been causing false belief and misinformation for time immemorial. So that's one reason we kind of use these historical case studies, that people haven't inherently changed. It's just that social media now made it much faster and easier to socially connect. It allows us to shape our connections, allows propagandists to pose as friends, all of this stuff. So I think in a lot of those ways, uh, these new media structures are mattering, are changing things. And as you point out, part of this is, I mean, I think this is connected to this point about journalists having to be catchy and novel, this idea that you've got only so much time to get people's attention, and so you better put out your best material, which is not necessarily the material that's gonna make your audience have really accurate beliefs. Yeah, yeah. over here. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the fake news phenomenon people caught on to that. Mm -hmm. um, do you find there are people who are recognizing that people know there's misinformation being put out there and the methods that are outlined in this book uh, and saying that, that right line and saying, well, other people are using all these methods and outlined very specifically about all the bias that you're talking about. Say, well, that's what everybody else is doing. That's what, that's what all the people that say, you know, kind of the earth is not flat. That's what they're doing. They're all conformed and they're and they're usually good science that you have to yeah. support propagandists um, and how they're doing it and all the evidence across history, but they're just saying, oh no, that applies to something to that the is other thing. Yeah. True. <laughs> I mean, in fact, this is a move that's used all the time. The like I'm not crazy, you're crazy move. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so people do in fact do this. And as you point out, someone who believes in flat earthing might very well be like, no, all of you are the sheeple who are misinformed. You're not thinking critically. You're failing to look at the right kinds of experts. I'm looking at the right kinds of experts. Um, I mean, this, this gets at this inherent problem in who do you trust and why, right? So this is one reason why the scientific enterprise and endeavor is really important. It doesn't always work perfectly. I mean, science is not perfect. It's done by humans. But in general, it's done by people who are mostly trustworthy and who are mostly trying to figure out the truth. And so it's a place where you can mostly go to get decent beliefs, right? So there is some answer to the person who's like, no, but my expert says this. Well, your expert isn't part of the right kinds of communities, communities that have been shaped over hundreds of years in ways that allow them to figure out decently true or accurate things about the world. 
Yeah. Uh, there was a question here. I was just wondering what you thought of, because I find myself, as a society, do you think we're going to become a society of skeptics where we now believe nothing? Yeah. Like it doesn't matter who tells me what. I'm not going to believe anything <laughs> anymore. I, I look at the example of the even with like Dr. Oz, mm -hmm. right, who was supposed to be somebody who could believe and drink red, you know, cider vinegar and then you will never be fat again. And <laughs> if it were that you're, easy, you're that one you. example, but I think we're just inundated. And you talk about journalists and scientific studies when we were talking about that. It's almost every article in the paper that we read in from this study and that study. But I find myself getting to a point, even with people I trust, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, I'm so not going to believe anything anymore, yeah. rather than start to weigh each one. And I've heard a lot of people bring up similar questions and worries. Um, are we going to end up in a place, a kind of post-truth era, yeah. people mm -hmm. sometimes call it, where you just don't know what to believe? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what's going to happen, but one thing I think that's very relevant to this is to understand that some people, some propagandists, are cynically promoting confusion and post-truth giving up. And they're doing this by bombarding people with information that's contradictory, that's confusing, that by trying to show that scientists are corrupt or that scientists aren't trustworthy. They're just like us. There's no reason we should trust science more than some other way of knowing, you know. Uh, so there are these cynical actors who are trying to get us to basically do what you're saying. Um, but that, in fact, doesn't mean that things are hopeless or that you should be skeptical. There still are real sources, you know, real newspapers <laughs> that have good reputations have a desire to uphold those reputations. And they do that by fact checking and trying to publish things that are mostly accurate. They don't always get it perfectly, but you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, these are decent places to get information that's real and that you can trust. Scientific studies mostly are decent places to get information that's real and that you can trust. Over a body of evidence, right? A body of evidence. Um, so we shouldn't be we shouldn't be cynical, in fact. We should resist the people who are trying to make us cynical about the existence of truth and accurate beliefs. Yes, in the in the back here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Connor, for your time. And your information, I'm very pleased to see a jackalope I haven't seen one of those in years. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there were no jackalopes in the book, and then we got the co there were no jackalopes in the book, and then we got the cover, and we were like, I guess we should put a jackalope into the text. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question will get to the, the observation about the line experiment, where there's one line, and it's similar to one of the other three, and the pressure of the group is to yeah make the right answer. But I'm sure that in the design somewhere there was the group would say, no, no, it was number two. What causes the person to say, no, it's number three? The is, is there the other side that was teased out of that? I understand the social pressure, the conformity, the non-compliance piece. Was mm -hmm. there any revelation on the guy that says, sorry, the person who says, no, it was number three? There's no question. Good. So one thing that I think is relevant here. So it, it was that two thirds of people in this case did not go along with it. And there were some other interesting variations done. So for example, if you offered people money to get the right thing, they were much more likely not to conform. However, if you made the task really hard and then offered them money, they were more likely to conform because they thought, well, I don't know, I'll just trust the other people, right? Um, so there are these things that came out. One interesting thing, if you actually read the transcript of these studies, so they took notes on what everyone said, is even the people who were bucking the consensus most of them didn't want to. So they kept saying things like, ah, I'm disagreeing with everyone again, darn it. You know, it was the 50s. Um, <laughs> so they were still feeling that pressure to conform, but took, you know, for whatever reason, had some other personality element that pushed them away from doing it. And I don't know about all, you know, I'm sure there's been research done on, you know, what, what might lead people to be less conformist or more, but I don't, I don't know that much about it. Sure, thank you very much. Sir. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, here in the blue shirt. So uh, you did these studies using models. Did you notice any changes as the scales changed? Did the models become more or less accurate, or do 
do things change depending on the size of your model? Yeah, good. So what we would do for most of these models is test different sizes of communities. So we look at smaller groups, medium groups, large groups. Um, it sort of would depend. So there are some things that change as you scale communities up and down when you're looking at these kind of, you know, models of social networks and the spread of belief. All the things that I reported on here were not things that would be um, dependent on community size, but I can give you an example of something that is. So I did another project uh, looking at the spread of retraction. So sometimes a scientific study is published and then retracted, and I wanted to understand why in so many cases do retractions kind of fail. People continue to believe the study for a long time even after it's been retracted. And in that case, the larger the group, the more prevalent the false belief got. It managed to get everywhere, whereas in small groups it would often kind of peter out before it managed to spread everywhere. So that's the kind of thing that can change, just to give an example. Yes, here. Yeah, I'd just like to take you back to your, uh, the, the issue of fairness in the treatment. So it's, it seems to me like you're equating fairness to a 50-50 percent treatment mm -hmm. of the news, and it doesn't, or the issue or, doesn't need or to be. Journalists yeah, or journalists. Well, yeah, and it yeah. doesn't need to be that way. And, uh, the end of the ruling of the fairness uh, uh, by the FCC actually led to the creation of Fox News and other news agencies mm -hmm. that are just one, uh, giving just one signal. So mm -hmm. could you expand a little bit on more? Because you seem to be like, oh, let's get rid of fairness. But <laughs> um, yeah, so this is good. And I should also mention there were benefits from the fairness doctrine besides just stopping Fox News. It's not clear to me that the rise of uh, partisan news was directly causally related to this, though there might be some uh, relation. Um, but there were other benefits, like often there are minority voices in a society that deserve to be heard. So on some political issue, often it is important to give someone who's in a minority voice a chance to speak rather than having them completely drowned out by a majority opinion. So that can be quite beneficial. So in particular, I'm most interested in the fairness doctrine as applied to scientific reporting for this reason that usually when you have two sides of an issue in science, not always, but often it's the case that there's more evidence for one side, and often it's the case that that evidence is pointing in the right direction. And so when you give equally weighted evidence, that causes a problem, as opposed to when you give evidence proportional to its existence in a scientific community, if that makes sense. So I'm mostly interested in that kind of case. Uh, here in the back, and then there's two over there. Um, in regards to referring to people as anti-vax, I personally refuse to use that form of language as it is on the survey. I found that how some of the people who have came up with that uh, anti-vaccination stance, part of it feels socially motivated, uh, the group think mentality, and another portion of it seems to me that um, in the past, in the medical fields, certain doctors, before germ theory was uh, widespread, used it to mitigate against the reusing of needles and bacterial infections. So certain doctors were using correct, uh, correct theory of the time to mitigate against bacterial infection deaths. So people who survived that learned that inherited belief system to where it's no longer valid in our current framework. So my understanding of that is how do we update a person's social inherited belief structure that was validated uh, via you know, Darwinian so, uh, natural selection survivorship model. Yeah, so um, I mean, I'll point out that anti-vax is literally just a shortening of anti-vaccine. I, I don't take this to be some offensive term. You are anti-vaccine if you're an anti-vaxxer. Uh, and I think a sort of important point here is that often in the cases of false beliefs, including in this case, there are reasons why people believe the things they do. It's not that people are stupid or deserve to be looked down on. It's not that people are cynical. Often people are in fact trying very hard to figure out what is true and then doing what they think is best on the grounds of what they believe. 
And I would find, so I, I, I'm not sure about this, um, the sort of thread of belief about possibilities of bacterial infection being the thing that has caused or led into the anti-vaccine movement. There have been people with anti-vaccine sentiments kind of throughout much of this history. It seems to be almost a kind of natural false belief to emerge, I think, because being pricked with needles and pricking your kids with needles is kind of upsetting. Um, another thing people have pointed out that's quite relevant is that a lot of anti-vaxxers are women, mothers, and often many of them have had bad experiences with the medical establishment because we know that in many cases, doctors sort of systematically uh, don't trust women's reports of their conditions or downplay women's pain and things like this. And so there can be kind of legitimate reasons to not trust authorities in some cases. But of course, that, that still doesn't make you right. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Maybe an extension on that same question. Uh, have you found a propensity for subject matter experts to be more inclined to change their mind with new information, like in the 21st century versus the 18th century? In other words, mm -hmm. You know, little cliques of subject matter experts will stick to their beliefs for whatever reason and be very hesitant to change their beliefs. Mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. not maybe necessarily misinformation, they just cling to the past and they're unwilling to change. Have you seen any, um, I guess, motivations of subject matter experts to be more inclined to change their mind and say, okay, you know what, yesterday I was wrong, but yeah. you right, and you know, please don't take away my tenure? Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, luckily, it's hard to take that away. Hat that, I can't. So, I'm not sure if this tendency has changed over time, and I know very little about whether anyone has actually gathered evidence to see do scientific experts, I mean, presumably scientists and other academics, are they more or less likely to change beliefs? I mean, for people who aren't familiar with this literature, one sort of well-known phenomenon in science is that people are resistant to changing their beliefs often in light of new evidence. So if you've been you know, a proponent of a theory for your entire career and then someone finds some evidence opposing that theory, people are often do not want to change and just jump on board with the next thing. So, and that, that's something that seems to have been true sort of throughout scientific history. But I don't know whether that's gotten better or worse. I mean, certainly just being in academia, I see lots of people who are still kind of holding on to their thing in the face of new evidence that seems to still be happening to some degree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's more of a comment. Uh, there is a group um, that distresses me, and that is politicians. We just went through uh, a federal election, and and it was dreadful. Uh, all the promises of silly stuff that we all know is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. All the attacks on the uh, on the opponents, which which were uh, uh, shaky at best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I hunger for a decent political leader that will give me a straight answer and do what he or she says we're going to do. Oh, well, they'll squash him in a minute. <laughs> they'll squash him in a minute. Or they'll yeah. squash her in a minute. I, I despair that <laughs> we, I don't see anybody coming up uh, in the political climate that's, that's going to do that. Mr. Brown going to Washington, if you will. Um, so there's something, I mean, so I've talked about how journalists often face incentives that are not necessarily going to get them so their goal is not to give you the best possible beliefs. That is not the goal of journalism. It's not the telos of journalism. Certainly the telos, the goal of a politician is not to inform the public well or necessarily to make the best decisions for the public, right? They have to get elected. They have to stay in power in order to do what they're doing. Now, of course, many people trust and listen to politicians, which does create a sort of weird informational thing where they don't necessarily have an incentive to spread true beliefs about, say, their opponents or their goals or their background. Um, but many people are listening to them. You know, they, you might say that they're kind of at the center of a social network, a focal point where many people are connected to them. And so politics can be a 
a place where false beliefs are kind of spread disproportionately. So I'll accept your, in your statement that the politicians, what's driving that person is to get elected. Mm -hmm. But one would think that if you had a politician that spoke the truth, because most of the stuff that we heard in the election was, was, was silly. Mm -hmm. We all know it was silly. But if, if we had, if we saw somebody that came and spoke the truth to us, I think they'd get a, a better chance of having uh, a favorable election. Yeah, that, that might be right. I mean, I don't, I don't think they would. It, it's a little hard to know. I mean, but you do sometimes, you do sometimes see politicians who kind of buck this trend and are. You know, they get a reputation as someone very dependable who's going to speak their mind, who you can trust, and sometimes it does benefit them. Um, yeah, I can well, give reality is a hard sell. Uh, can be, can be. Climate, I mean, climate change is a case like that. People don't like it. Um, shall we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we're going <laughs> to thank uh, Kaylin as well for a great talk, and uh, hopefully we're going to see many of you next week.